thanks to everybody for coming uh, on the, I don't know what you, what's the English word for the second to last? Maybe that's the word, second to last. Uh, penultimate, that's what I was looking for, thank you. Penultimate lecture in the lecture series. So today we have Mark Rivera presenting to us from New Jersey. Uh, he can have coffee and lunches with uh, lots of people, with companies that also are based in New Jersey. Um, that's your job, right? Uh, have coffee and lunches, Mark? <laughs> uh, that's a, a real nice way to put it, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So he's the Director of Business Development and Southern Research. Um, joined a couple of years ago, and I've joined Mark uh, at Bio, for example, some of the meetings uh, where you interface with other potential uh, companies that may want to license technology from you. Uh, I'm also pleased to see Scott here from the Harvard Institute for Innovation and Entrepreneurship because um, UAB's office does some of it for UAB technologies as well, and a drug discovery, and Alabama Drug Discovery Alliance, well, Mark takes on that role. But if you have other technologies that uh, UAB wants to license li on your behalf, then he'll be a really good one to talk to. Uh, so with that, without further ado, I'll let Mark um, get going and uh, tell us all about, you know, princes and frogs and princesses and life. <laughs> yeah, that's that's... Sometimes this is a little bit more of a, a fairy tale than not necessarily in a good way either. But uh, <laughs> thanks, Mike. <laughs> I appreciate it. So, so uh, what I'd like to talk about today is really the, sort of the, the business development, which is a very sort of loose description of trying to find partners for programs. And it's not a, a clearly defined thing. In fact, it means different things to different segments of pharma and uh, you may not realize pharma is itself a really very big and broad industry. So if, if we think about the, set, the sort of the big segments of, of pharma, the ADDA is most like a small biotech company. We've got uh, really good ideas, cool programs, smart scientists, not a lot of resources in the, in the uh, relative sense versus the big guys and some of the other uh, larger well-funded biotechs. So what we're looking for in terms of business development goals is going to be different than what the big pharmas are looking for, what Glaxo's and Pfizer's and Novartis are looking for. And what they're looking for is different than what the generic pharmas are, are looking for in what they do. It's a whole different, uh, whole different beast, but it's just the idea that business development covers a lot of territory. And in general, it's... Uh, in some ways, to a lot of people, a lot of, especially a lot of scientists, a lot of researchers, business development is kind of a black box. You start off with, you know that you got some really cool, some really innovative research results, and then there's some stuff that happens kind of in the middle here, and then suddenly, boom, you get a ton of money from uh, pharma companies, big biotechs, or even some of these well-funded VCs that fly around in private jets. And, you know, take the rest of the day off. It's not quite that easy. We wish it was, but then, you know, they wouldn't keep me around. So I think um, we can try and build a working definition for us for, from an ADDA perspective of what we have. So all of our programs, be they in oncology or neurodegeneration, infectious disease, they are all very early in the big scheme of things. You've, you've been told about the preclinical versus clinical versus marketed, the whole a massive pipeline. So we're way on the left hand side of that, as you know. So we have, with limited resources, we can discover new things, but we can only go as far as IND, perhaps maybe phase one, but then things start getting a lot more expensive and, and it's a little beyond our, our capabilities. So I think for our purposes, we can look at business development as trying to find partners in industry, bigger partners, that are both willing and able they have to be both A and B, willing and able to take our programs that we think are very cool, take them into the clinic, do the phase one, phase two, phase three development, and then ultimately, with any luck, take them to the market. So if we look inside that black box that I mentioned before in just a little bit more detail, uh, we can kind of lay out the steps that are required to go from uh, one of our programs being a great idea in our hands to getting it into a partner's hands. Now on paper, it's pretty straightforward. As I said, you, you start off on the left here with prospecting, looking for companies that could be interested. Uh, you have in-depth scientific discussions with these guys as you go forward. You negotiate the, uh, the deal structure, the money, and who does what. Uh, there's due diligence effort to make sure that what everyone says is actually true. 
and then the final closing of the deal. Again, a very sort of linear process in that concept. But in reality, it looks a little bit more like this. It's, it's sort of a, a wandering around, bumping into walls, tripping over things, and uh, back and forward. Um, and sometimes, frankly, it can be more than a little frustrating. Um, you guys probably remember fairy tales from when you were young about the uh, princesses who would go around trying to find her Prince Charming. And the Prince Charming was a, looked like a frog, so she had to go around and kiss all the different frogs until she found the one that would turn into a prince. That's kind of what we do a lot of in business development. Um, there's a lot of that going on. And sort of if you accept that and if you know that you have to go around and kissing frogs, it's really important to try and reduce the overall frog to prince ratio as much as you possibly can. It just, you know, makes life easier. So you have to understand what it is you have and what it is you're trying to do. So you have to understand on our programs, you have to understand the indication. Is this an oncology program? If so, solid tumors versus liquid tumors. If so, you can go on from there. Uh, the kind of competition that may be out there. Other companies that are working in the same area, if not exactly the same target, then maybe the same or a similar mechanism. And also understand our programs and the good parts of it and frankly, the parts that may need a little bit of help and have some gaps in it because no program is in fact perfect. And then you sort of look out at the big broad world of pharmaceutical and biotech and try and figure out which companies are in this therapeutic area. Not everyone is in anti-infectives, for example. Who is a program that could be competing? Do you want to talk to someone who's doing something that is essentially competing with what we have? Or are we just going to be giving them too much information? Some companies are open to early stage programs like we have. Some are not. They'd rather wait a while and take something a little bit later and less risky. And ultimately, the question, do they have any interest in our programs? So there's a lot of filtering going on here, starting with the, with the whole universe and then narrowing it down to companies that, that might fit the profile. And even with all of these filters and, and reductions and going through the lists, we still talk with a whole range of different kinds of partners. We talked to the big pharmas, not to talk about going to bio and meeting with the companies, uh, the big pharmas, the, the Novartis's and Pfizer's and Glaxo's of the world. Um, there are a lot of regional companies out there that are based in Europe or Japan, other areas that really focus only on those areas, but still can be very, very good partners to work with. Uh, specialty pharma companies, those that focus in a specific area like infectious disease, neurodegeneration, uh, the kind of the classic biotechs that you think about. And another group I, I call the in-betweeners. These are the guys that look to license preclinical programs, then invest in them, take them through phase one, take them through phase two, and then at some point around phase two, license them out again to the big guys, the Pfizer's and Galaxies of the world. And we also talk about invest, talk to investors as well. So we're kind of keeping all of our options open because we're never quite sure where we're gonna get lucky and where lightning's gonna strike. Um, but despite this broad range of companies and the different priorities they may have, pretty much all of our discussions with these guys start off the same way. You walk into the room, exchange business cards, do the introduction, you sit down, they look at you and they say, so, tell me about your program. What's good about this? And there's your first frog of the day, right? <laughs> and some of the people actually look a little like that, but we're not going to go into that too much. Detail. <laughs> but that's how it starts off. And then all the, the, we end up getting standard questions from the companies. Uh, no matter what the program is in, it's like, so how far along are you, even though you're preclinical, have you filed a patent? Do you have any in vivo data? Um, and quite a lot of times, so how long before you're ready to get to an IND or you can get this to an IND phase? Because these are all areas where there is a, a value inflection point. There are areas where there is a reduction in risk from the perspective of the part, potential partner. So they're, they're trying to get a sense of where we, we're at and how much work there is to be done from where we are today. Ultimately, it all comes down to the data. 
um, because without good science coming out of the labs, without our scientists really doing all the controls and checking everything, business development has nothing to do. We don't, without data, we, we can't do anything. And the data that we're looking for, that partners are looking for really on the basic science side, are we as a, as a team offering a novel insight into a disease? Um, do we understand the mechanism that we're looking at? Do we know how our compounds are working? Uh, or is it kind of a black box again, which is generally not a good thing? Uh, can we draw a, a clear linkage between our mechanism and our target and the clinical samples or, or defined genetic studies that show that yes, there is a A causes B type relationship? And if we have any in vivo data, that's always a good thing, much better than cell-based data. On the applied science side, do we have good chemistry? Do we have good compounds? Is there a good pharmacokinetic profile? Any issues with toxicity that we've seen? In it? And again, the intellectual property status is really, really important. So all of this together in a package, we go through and we try and talk people through it and explain where we are, uh, where we've been, and ultimately where we're going. With any luck, after that uh, bit of a song and dance on our part, the person across the table says, yeah, I'd like to find out more about this. Not everyone does, by the way. This is not an easy point to get to, even though it, it may seem that way. A lot of them say, nah, it's too early for us, not a good fit. Yeah, so we, we get a, lose a lot of, lot of frogs on that, on that one step right there. But in this case, let's go just say that they like what we had to say. They said, please tell me more. Usually that means putting a, a confidentiality agreement into place so we can have better discussions. And that is really, that, that's kind of a win from our perspective. Now that first meeting went well. Where do we go from here? Well, let's go back and look at that, that uh, flow we talked about originally, that, that sort of linear progression, because we've gotten all of this far at this point. Still got a long way to go. Uh, and what we really need uh, is more science, uh, because our programs being as early as they are, um, and the data package not being terribly large, we really need to get their scientists to understand what we are doing and what we have done. Because if their scientists don't understand our program, if they don't get excited about it, if they don't really believe it, if they have concerns, then the business thing is never going to happen. So we really need to get their experts to talk to our experts and they can have a wonderful time looking through the data and answering the question, building that level of confidence. And really, from the point of view of the, of the potential partner, there is no such thing as too much data. They always ask for more than we will ever be able to provide to them. Hopefully what we can provide to them is enough to make them go forward. Now, part of this um, deep dive into the science is often takes the form of a material transfer agreement or an MTA. Uh, sometimes referred to as what I refer to as a trust yet verify. So they, they, they understand our data, they know what we've done, they believe us, but they would like to check it out themselves and make sure it actually does work. So the way this works is it's an agreement we put in place. We provide the company with the compound that we're testing, and then they see if they can reproduce our results. And often they also might test it in other systems or models that we don't have available to us. And they explain all of this to us ahead of time. We agree to the test they're going to do. So we have complete transparency as to the studies they're going to be doing. And it all makes perfect sense and it's all scientifically rational. So it all sounds pretty simple. Until it's not. And I'll share with you a couple of things that I've been dealing with in the last probably six to eight weeks. So here's an example, dealing with a large global pharma company on one of our programs. And again, the agreement's in place, we know the studies, we're all happy that they're gonna do the studies, we're waiting for it, and we get a message from them one day. It says, um, uh, we're a little behind schedule, and we're gonna have to wait because the technician who does these experiments left the company unexpectedly. Now, yeah, just give this a second. This is a global company, these guys have like 70, 75,000 employees around the world, and they have one person, just one, who can do these experiments. So that adds, you know, a couple of months to our timeline until they can find someone else to step into the lab. 
next message from them. All right, we got the new person, but now our main assay suddenly isn't working. And we have no idea why not. So hey, we'll get back to you. I cannot make this stuff up. <laughs> so we're then it takes them about six weeks or so to figure out why their assay was crashing. Then we got good news. And they're ready to assays are studies are working, assays are up and going, controls are good. Now they're gonna test our compounds and see what they get. And a month later, uh, sorry, we're not going to move forward because we just can't reproduce your data. Now, given the track record with this particular company, I'm wondering, is our data just not correct or is it just that they had more bugs in their system? But that was a, I guess, four to five months of life that we will not get back. <laughs> That's part of the deal. Another quick example, a Chinese pharma company, a very large one actually, interested in one of our programs. Uh, we put the agreement into place, outlined the studies, we've got everything all signed, ready to go, we get a message. Yes, we want to add one more study to the program. Okay, so now we have to amend our agreement because the MTA is in fact a legally binding agreement. So we have to amend that, that means more lawyers. But we do it because we want to be cooperative. And we do. And then another message. Hey, that, that one someone that you guys have, we can buy it, but it'd be faster if you just sent it. Another amendment. And then, oh, by the way, that other compound that you mentioned on our call last week, our scientists think it'd be a good idea to throw some of that in there too, just in case, as a positive control. Another amendment. And then most recently, as we're all ready to go, putting dry ice into the containers, ready to ship it out. Wait, 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 don't send anything yet. Hang on. We don't have all of our paperwork in order. We need to get a permit from our government to import this. So we'll get back to you. So even the simple things like what should be an easy MTA, an easy study, uh, end up being a little bit more challenging and, and a little frustrating than one would like. But, Assuming that all gets done, and assuming that everything is positive on the data, and the scientists are happy, as I said, because it's worth keeping them in the loop and keeping them um, excited about what's going on, we can then think about, about terms, and thinking about the deal, a deal and what the terms of that would be, the important bits of it. And that all gets summarized into something called a term sheet, which is actually often many pages long, but it summarizes what each party in the agreement will do and uh, what they would receive from an agreement should it go into place. It includes things like who pays what to whom and when, what is the territory that they're getting the rights to, uh, are they just getting rights for North America and Europe or would they be getting rights for the entire world, uh, what's the decision making process, who's responsible for different things, uh, what happens if one of the partners changes their mind and backs out and you know conflict resolution is another major part so these things go on for quite a while there's a lot of back and forth discussions on the phone by email but ultimately the goal here is to just very simply focus on the main points of any kind of an agreement uh, that we would enter into with a partner after the term sheets in place then we go on to the, the diligence aspect of life where everything is shared because uh, we're asking people to, to pay us a, a good amount of money. They wanna make sure that what we're showing is in fact what we have. So they would have the right scientifically to come into our, come in and look at everything that we have, all of our notebook by notebook type detail, look at every bit of animal data, go through experiment by experiment, talk to the scientists and go through and make sure that the conclusions that we have from the data in fact, uh, are correct. Uh, they look at our intellectual property, look at the patents that have issued, applications, we have a freedom to operate. Uh, is there anyone else that's gonna say that we're infringing on their patent? Because really, at such an early stage, intellectual property really is the most valuable asset that one has. Um, while we're not really uh, a group that has clinical stage programs, if we did, uh, just for, <laughs> sort of filling this whole process out, uh, they would be able to come in and look at the clinical data that would be generated, including uh, you know, every patient and every lab value and every, every blood draw. And if there's manufacturing, of course, that's also part of the whole diligence effort. And 
I've been involved in previous jobs with full scale diligence efforts. They'll take sometimes three days of 12 hour days going through all of the stuff. But in the end, it's really worth it because you end up going to the definitive agreement, which is all of those terms that we had in the term sheet, all wrapped up now in a lot of legal language. Also includes a lot of what are called representations and warranties, which are promises and yes, I swear that we can type statements. We, have, we own this technology, we can enter this deal, we won't sue you if we mess up, we're gonna put our best, best efforts into the, all of that. Anyway, it's a lot of, a lot of billable hours for the lawyers, um, but certainly worth it because it is a legal contract and we get people to sign it, and that is really the main point of all of this, trying to make the deal. Um, closing the deal itself at the end, even once we've got everything figured out, a big thing is getting final signatures from the people who are allowed to sign. And uh, I once had a four week delay with a European company because all of their senior management went on holiday because it was August. <laughs> My CEO, who was not European, was not only confused, but really, really not happy about that. <laughs> Nothing we could do. Just kind of smile and go with it. Uh, get the signatures. Sometimes these things have to go through legal review by the US government for antitrust. That's another few weeks. But really, ultimately, that gets done, and you can go and you can cash the check, which is a beautiful thing. And after that, of course, Relax a little bit, hopefully getting together with your new partners and celebrate the deal that took so long to get put into place. And then like any other wonderful night out with new friends, there's always the next morning. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to think about, okay, now that we've gotten this done and in place, we have to think about what's next. And that is something that is often referred to as alliance management. Managing the, the new agreement between the two groups uh, how do you keep track of things? Because in that agreement that we had, there's an obligation by both sides to keep track of budgets and meetings and schedules and timelines, reporting to senior management teams, et cetera. So that all has to be coordinated between the two groups. Uh, there's also hitting milestones, very important, because both sides have agreements, things that we're gonna to do to help the others be successful. And do we need to move around internal resources to help that happen? So it's a lot of after deal logistics and, and working. But if you look at, it's at a deal timeline in general, at least in theory, one could do a deal from your initial you know, frog kissing to, to the, uh, signing the signing the agreement in about six months. And assuming you have a very good frog to prince ratio, you might be able to uh, find one or two good companies to work with and take those guys all the way through the process. That is of course theory. In reality, probably 18 to 24 months or longer to get a deal finalized, not counting summer vacations in Europe. Um, and we can talk with 40 companies or more because uh, we hear the word no in so many different ways at so many different points it is pretty much unbelievable. Um, but why companies will go forward, why they say yes ultimately, Number of reasons. Um, they have a, maybe they have a gap in their pipeline they need to fill, and we fill in right because they have things in the clinic. They need things preclinically. Um, many times, they these the bigger players, especially, are invested in the therapeutic area, not just in terms of clinical development, but in terms of uh, marketing, distribution, promotional materials, uh, dealings with medical societies, medical thought leaders. They have a real ecosystem in a certain therapeutic area. They need to feed the beast, basically, and we can help them with that as well. They see our program shows value, uh, both scientifically and commercially, and sometimes, frankly, it's just they want to do a deal because they want to keep up with all, keep up with the Joneses, keep up with the pack. But if the check is good, we'll, we'll go along with that. Mm -hmm. There are also a lot of reasons why companies will say no. As I said, we hear this in many, many different ways. Quite often, our program is just too early for them. And by too early, one can use the word too risky. The further along a program goes, the less risk there is and the more value there is. So many of the large companies are willing to spend more and have less risk. Um, 
Sometimes they're looking at uh, multiple programs for an indication. They need a new oncology program. They're looking at three or four different ones. They pick the other guys for any number of reasons. Sometimes they're not looking to license anything at all. They're just trying to find out what else is going on in the world. Who else is doing what? And gathering a little competitive intelligence. That's very frustrating when that happens, but after it's over, you kind of know what happened to you. Uh, and sometimes there are unresolved questions, again, going to the point of risk or the financials just really don't add up for them. That can happen. So companies can say yes, they say no. Uh, that's the frog and the prince. But things switch between frogs and princes. The status flips back and forth. Uh, sometimes a company will say no and then come back a couple of months later and say, uh, it's been a change in our strategy. And so we're looking at this again. Or sometimes they say yes, and then come back a few months later and say, uh, we're going through a reorganization. So we're not doing this anymore. We're out of this therapeutic area. Doesn't mean the program isn't any good. It means that they're not doing it anymore. So you have to kind of start back to square one again. But in general, part of what I try and do, in addition to simply licensing things out, is I try and generate essentially a virtuous circle by going out to companies with our programs, with our new science and our very cool data from the ADDA. It's possible to get feedback from these companies. If you talk to five or six or seven companies, you can understand where the weak points of our program are. You can understand what things that these companies would need in order to get excited about it. I can bring that back, hopefully, provide that information to our researchers about where are the gaps, what are the things that are really gonna drive interest? And they can then hopefully use that information to maybe refine the program a little bit, maybe reprioritize a few experiments, maybe rethink about how they're approaching the, the program and the target, tweak it, and then we go back out again with, with a new and hopefully improved program. And, and again, try and generate uh, that, that driving interest. Um, and essentially, what, and we have something that ends up looking a little bit like a Krebs cycle, which I apologize for. But uh, we have a virtuous cycle, and the idea of being able to convert through this virtuous cycle, convert these ADDA programs into finalized deals uh, using the, the inputs, not only money, but also the scientific perspective of pharma and biotech companies, and really, and really do some good for, for everybody from the researchers and the ADDA all the way through to hopefully one day patients. So that's my, as I say, brief but spectacular look at business development. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Any questions from the audience? And just, just uh, I'll, I'll start off just to provide a little bit of context. Can you give us a sense of, um, you know, magnitudes of deals, just so that we as academic eggheads have a sense of how much it takes to go all the way? We know it's expensive, but let's say you have a, in vivo proof of concept in an oncology model, are you talking about a hundred thousand dollar deal, a one million dollar ah. deal, ten million dollar deal? You know, kind of a sense yeah. of that. Okay, so that's that's a great question, and I thank you for that. Um, so there are different pieces to any kind of a deal. Uh, we have the the upfront part of it, which is what they pay when the deal is signed, and that's the cash, the, the check that we cash, and then there are monies that are paid as the deal moves, as, as the program moves forward through milestones, let's say an IND filing or clinical proof of concept, et cetera. So the only real money we, we would have is the, the upfront cash because that's not refundable and that's what they're willing to pay upfront. Everything else beyond that is fingers crossed we're gonna get this cash type of cash. We may or may not. So the upfront is important for something as, as you described, like a, a clinical proof of concept is there in animal models, et cetera, et cetera. Probably, depending on the indication, we're looking at something like uh, in the upfront, single digit millions of dollars in an upfront. Okay. And then as the program goes forward, uh, you'd get the larger sort of potentially double digit if possible later as, as the risk goes down and the, the value of the program goes up. And um, do companies ever try to buy up programs to, um, what's the word? Put them on the shelf? To, yeah, to squash the competition? <laughs> uh, they can, but what we make a very 
clear thing, clear point of in the agreements, the definitive agreement. Remember, I, I talked about each side has responsibilities and roles and things they have to do. One of the things that we put into our agreements is something called a diligence requirement, which means that they will take our program and invest in it and work on it with the effort that they would put into one of their own programs. Mm -hmm. And if they don't, and they have to report to us on the progress they're making as the, as the thing goes forward. So if they don't move the program forward uh, because they want to put it on a shelf, uh, then after a certain period of time, we would get that program back. Yeah, and they and would then we could then take it. payment payment. They would be out. They would not get their money back. We would get the program back, and then we could take it back out and, and provide licensing it to somebody else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, because we know that 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 would happen. That has happened in the past. So we try and make sure that won't happen again with us. Yeah. Let's go ahead. Question. Um, you've talked about early technologies, which is largely what UAB comes out of UAB. Uh, large pharma is not going to just jump on that. They have people at the door with technologies you know, every day. So what what is your strategy for marketing an early technology that maybe has some in vivo proof of concept data, has not gone through any preclinical toxicology or PK studies? Um, you just call it Pfizer or Amgen or Fall? Or, <laughs> you, I mean, you depend on someone like yourself who may have a network of contacts, investors, et cetera, these mm -hmm. things. What, you know, what is, what is your, do you have a general um, strategy or is it just depends on the technology? Uh, I do have a sort of a general, general plan of attack. Uh, you know, Micah mentioned earlier BIO, which is the big uh, partnering conference that's held once a year. Uh, just to give you a sense of scale, that is a conference that has it's primarily business development focus. There are other things going on in parallel, but primarily BD. There are about, I don't know, 18 to 20,000 people who go to that conference every year uh, from companies all around the world. Um, and that's where we can talk to these companies. So we can online through the, through the partnering forum, we can list the programs that we have. We can put up little blurbs about them and how they're, how they're special. And then I start going through, in fact, I'm doing it now, go through and uh, start sending messages to all of the companies that I think might be interested. Again, the ones that are in the area that I talked about earlier on one of the other slides, in the area that may be open to these early stage assets. And to your point, not everyone is. And I send them a message and say, let's meet at bio. Um, you may like this program X because it is first in class, it is novel, uh, it addresses an unmet medical need, uh, we have some in vivo data, and uh, some of them will accept that invitation. Others will not. So it just, it's, it's really a numbers game. It ends up being a pretty flat pyramid overall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah and, and, and to illustrate that a little bit further, uh, so I've, I've been going to bio with Mark a couple of years now, but then Mark also goes to Bio Europe in the spring and the fall, JP Morgan. So even I haven't only been a few times have started to form relationships with some of the people that we meet. So you walk through the floor of the Business Development Forum and well, we ran into somebody on the, the escalator to our packet puck pickup one year. I mean, Mark is just gone left and right. Hey, John, hey, Susie, hey, Kathy. So it's this relationship building probably that really come into play in, in building that network. So you know the picture too, and they're going to actually read your email. Yeah, yeah, and 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 a reputation. And to that point, Mike, a reputation is is important too because you want to be known as someone who sort of doesn't oversell. And if you know someone, uh, you have a network, and you know someone who is with Company X, they're not interested in your program. Quite often, they move to a new job, and when they do, I've had people actually write to me and say, you know, that thing that I turned a thumbs down on about uh, six months ago. Is that still available? Because I'm now with a new company and they're interested in that area. So can you, let, let's have a chat. So there are interesting ways these things happen, but uh, it just, it's a lot of, a lot of uh, grunt work in terms of getting, getting the message out. Yeah. Good. Any more questions? Let me double check into the chat box real quick. Um, okay. No chat questions from there. So with that then Mark, let's, Let's thank Mark.
Great job. <laughs> Thank you.